It is Word of Life Fellowship Sunday evening service. I'm Pastor Bob. And if you would like to contact me, you can call me at area code 561-331-7533. And we've been doing a discussion of Acts chapter 13. The Apostle Paul has been giving a speech that we have been digesting verse by verse. And last Sunday night, we completed the speech and we got to Acts 13, verse 44, one week ago. And we'll just review that one statement for the beginning of this evening's service in Acts 13, 44. The next Sabbath day, almost the whole city of Antioch in the region of Pisidia gathered at the synagogue to hear the word of the Lord. And then, Kyle, do you have verse 49? Where are we at again? Uh, it's Acts 13. And um, actually, what it is, it's, it's, we started with Acts 13, reviewing from last week, the verse 44, which is Acts 13, 44. On the next Sabbath day, almost the whole city of Pisidia in um, Pisidia is the region, Antioch is the particular city where the synagogue is. So, Acts 13, 44. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city of Antioch and Pisidia gathered at the synagogue to hear the word of the Lord. But, the, but when the Jewish leaders saw the crowds of people that had come to hear Paul and Barnabas as guest speakers in the synagogue. We know that from the context of last week's message that the next week Paul and Barnabas are going to be guest speakers in the synagogue. Well, in Acts 13, verse 45, when the Jews, I believe a reference to the Jewish leadership, when the Jews saw the crowds show up at the synagogue to hear Paul and Barnabas speak, when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. And that motivated them to speak to Paul in such a way as to contradict or begin to contradict what Paul was saying and to heap abuse on him. <laughs> and then how did he respond? Curiously, in verse 46, along with his apostolic body, Barnabas. Acts 13, 46. But Paul and Barnabas answered the Jews boldly, we had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you reject the word of God and don't consider yourselves worthy of eternal life on earth, we now turn to the non-Israeli nations, for the Lord has commanded us, I have made you, and the Greek is singular, I have made you a light to the nations that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the people of the nations other than Israel heard this message from Paul and Barnabas, they were glad and they honored the word of the Lord. And all who were appointed into eternal life on earth believed. Now we go on to the survey of the passage, Acts 13, verse 49. The word of the Lord spread through the whole region, going on to say in verse 50. But the Jewish leaders incited or negatively motivated the God-honoring women of high social standing and the leading men of the city of Pisidia in Antioch. <coughs> and what does it say in the rest of that verse 50? They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas? Yeah, 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 that's what it is. That's what it is. So, Acts 13, 
fifty. Thanks, Kyle. Acts thirteen fifty. But when the Jewish leaders Can I read the whole verse 50 to me if you could? But the Jews incited the prominent God-fearing women and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from the district. Okay, so 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 thanks for the memory refreshment, Kyle. Mm -hmm. I, I'm using the NIV for this in Acts 13, verse 50. But the Jewish <coughs> leaders... They incited, they negatively motivated the, the God-honoring women of high social standing and the leading men of the city of Antioch in Pisidia, and they stirred up the persecution against Paul and Barnabas, expelling them like they, they threw them out of town. They expelled them from their district or their region. But look at verse 51. Very curious to me, the reaction of Paul and Barnabas. When they were being persecuted, what was their reaction in verse 51? This is Acts 13, 51. So Paul and Barnabas shook the dust off their feet as a warning to those people and went to another town called Iconium. But in verse 52, Acts 13, 52, the disciples in Pisidia, and the main city there is Antioch, so Acts 13, 52, and the disciples in Antioch in Pisidia, they were filled with joy and they were filled with the Holy Spirit even though the apostles Paul and Barnabas got run out of town and went to another city. But nonetheless, the people that had embraced the good news that they heard Paul and Barnabas preach were in Acts 13.52 filled with joy and filled with the Holy Spirit. That was in the city of Antioch and Pisidia. But when it comes to the next verse, which goes into chapter 14, Acts 14, verse 1, Paul and Barnabas, going to the new city called Iconium, Paul and Barnabas in Iconium went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. Now, is this next part coming up where it says, there they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed? Yes. Okay. It goes on to say, but the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the non-Israeli nations and poisoned their minds against the brothers Paul and Barnabas. Going on to Acts 14.3. So Paul and Barnabas spent a considerable amount of time there in Iconium. And they spoke boldly for the Lord who confirmed the message of His grace by the method of enabling Paul and Barnabas to perform miraculous signs and wonders. And now on to Acts 14.4. The city of Iconium was divided. Some of the people sided with the Jewish leadership. Others people sided with the visiting apostles, Paul and Barnabas. But in verse 5, this is Acts 14, 5. There was a plot against the life of Paul and Barnabas. The NIV says there was a plot afoot among the people of the other nations as well as the Jews together with the leaders of other nations and the leaders of the Jews. There was a plot afoot among the non-Jews and the Jews and among their leaders to mistreat and stone Paul and Barnabas to death. Next verse, Acts 14, 6. 
But Paul and Barnabas learned of the plot against them, and they fled town. They ran away to the Lycaonian cities of Lystra and Derbe and to the surrounding country, where in the final verse of our discussion tonight in Acts 14, 7, they continued to preach the good news. So I'm just going to say, before I do comments on this passage that we just surveyed in Acts 13, 44, all the way through chapter 14, verse 7, having surveyed it, I just want to ask the Lord for help here. Lord, I do, I do pray that as a result of you ministering to us by your Holy Spirit, that we would get life out of this passage of Scripture. That we would actually feel refreshed in your presence because of you teaching us and us getting out of the passage what you want us to get as pertaining to life and godliness, which is you, God, living your life through us. So that we, Father God, may know what it means today to preach the good news. And I pray, Father God, according to the riches of your glory, that we be strengthened with the power of the Spirit to discern in this passage your ways and your thoughts. Because we want to apply in our 21st century world what it is that we take from this passage for the sake of outreach, for the sake of encountering people with all kinds of reactions to the message. But my personal prayer, my personal prayer, God, for the 21st century congregation, 2,000 years later than what we're reading about in the book of Acts. My prayer, God, is that we would just, out of the overflow of our heart, speak the unconditional good news to everyone that we encounter. And if they're resistant... I pray that we continue to speak the truth in love to them. If they persecute us, I pray that we be filled with the Holy Spirit like Stephen, who even while he was being stoned to death, prayed, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. Lord, that's the kind of witness to Saul of Tarsus that was present among the crowd while Stephen was being stoned to death. That's the kind of witness to Saul of Tarsus that I believe was a seed that was planted that day. Because Stephen, filled with the Holy Spirit, was just like Jesus on the cross, saying in Luke 23, verse 24, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. And indeed, Saul of Tarsus later said in 1 Timothy, 115 and following that I acted in ignorance. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.13, he actually said, I acted in ignorance. That he admitted that he was one of the people Jesus was talking about when he said, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. Paul said, I acted in ignorance. Mm -hmm. Because Paul was a persecutor of the congregation. And when he said in 1 Corinthians 15.10, by the grace of God, I am who I am. He is not kidding. It is only your grace, Jesus, that caused him to be an apostle. He was only kidding when he said in 1 Timothy 1.13. Actually, it's 1 Timothy 1.12. But he was only kidding when he said, God appointed me into the ministry because he found me to be faithful. Why do I say kidding? Because the next verse he gives his resume. In the Greek, I being a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent man 
who acted in ignorance and unfaithfulness. Jesus, reveal yourself to us so that we may take the Bible literally when you want us to take the Bible literally. Like Hebrews 6.18, two unchangeable things in which it's impossible for God to lie. The promise and the oath that confirms the promise. And let us discern when it's divine humor and let us discern when it's like Jacob whose name means he grasps the heel as if to say, to trip someone up, because Father God, in the Scripture, there are those occasions when you have revealed, as in Isaiah 28, as mentioned in Romans 11, where you put stumbling blocks in front of people to trip over. But Lord, you have called us here at Word of Life Fellowship to pray that we would not trip over any stumbling blocks as we read Scripture. Why? Because, Lord, we want to relate to 1 Corinthians 2, 6 and following a congregation that we pray is on wisdom for the mature, is feeding on wisdom for the mature, a wisdom described as secret and hidden, a wisdom that you've destined for our glory before time began, the glory being in Proverbs 25, 2. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter, but it's the glory of a king to search the matter out. We want to search these things out. We want to understand why in Jeremiah 6.16 we can come to the crossroads and wonder why does one scripture say this and another scripture can be saying the opposite thing. Perhaps in the same chapter. You put these contrasts in the Bible intentionally. You've got a purpose for this. And it's only in the mind of the Spirit that we discern your wisdom behind what you're doing as you don't lay out the Bible all the same, all plain, all simple, to where everybody reading it on the planet in their natural mind would be able to agree with everybody else on the planet because it would all be so simple and straightforward and clear. But Lord, there is such a thing in 1 Corinthians 2.6 as a wisdom for the mature described in the following verse as a secret and hidden wisdom that you've destined for our glory, the glory of searching out the things that you've concealed, and it's for your purpose and your glorious purpose that you've concealed them because you want them to be revealed. It's kind of like the, the, the Deuteronomy 29, 29. Talking to the nation of Israel who got a revelation of God that the other nations didn't get, who got to hear God's audible voice, that the other nations get, didn't get a chance to hear. Yeah, mm -hmm. Amen. So he says in Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the ever-living God. There's stuff that God just knows for his own purpose. The secret things belong to the ever-living God, but the things revealed to you people, the things that He's shown you, the things that He's let you in on, the secrets that He's shown you, these truths belong to you and to your children, that you may walk in these truths forever. Lord, we want to walk in what you have revealed to us as non-negotiable truths. And the gospel of Jesus is non-negotiable. And what is the gospel of Jesus? Amen. Yes, amen. Yes, Ron, amen. Jesus, in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15, Ron is alluding to these awesome non-negotiable truths here. For the love of the anointed high priest controls us because we're convinced that one man died as a legal representative of all people. And therefore all people got credit with being crucified on that cross. And he died on behalf of all people. So that the people that are living to hear Paul's exhortation would no longer live for themselves but live for him who on behalf of them died and on behalf of them came back to life. So Jesus, you not only died in everybody's 
behalf to cancel their sins automatically the moment you died on their behalf. It's like they themselves in the eyes of the law died for their own sins on that cross and therefore the law doesn't hold any charges against them after they got the death penalty. They're free from the law like Romans 7 verse 1. The law only has authority over a person that's living. Not somebody that's died under the law's penalty. That person's free from the law. And that's the whole world of people free from the law. But Jesus, you resurrected on behalf of everyone. And because you are everyone's righteousness in the eyes of the law, and because you are everyone's holiness in the eyes of the Father, and because you are the good news that you have a good relationship with everyone, regardless of what we do, think, believe, etc., we are loved unconditionally by you, our God, who became a human being in the person of Jesus and died our death and came back to life to assure us that we're all going to get eternal life on earth. Every single one of us will. Even those that have already died. When Jesus comes back, you're going to raise them all from the dead. You're going to recreate their humanity so that they're going to have their inheritance on the earth. So paradise will be here. Eternal life on earth, just like it's Genesis chapters 1 and 2, when we find that God is here on earth among us, and we have a quality of life in His presence, and life is a good thing every moment of every day. That's the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, and that's the kingdom, God, that you're letting us enter into now, even in the spiritual sense of Romans 14, 17, entering in now by means of the Holy Spirit to your kingdom described as a kingdom of righteousness and a kingdom of peace and a kingdom of joy. In the Holy Spirit, we experience this kingdom of your righteousness and your joy and your peace because, Lord Jesus, in the Spirit, we're freed from that old slavery to that law system of government which put burdens on us that our human nature could not carry burdens too heavy for us to bear. But Jesus, you bore it all on the cross. You carried the burden of the law for everyone on the planet. And you died under the law's penalty, but not in your innocent name. In the name of Bob Bu and people like me around the globe that were just mere humans that couldn't handle a spiritual law in Romans 7, 14, but felt like they were unspiritual. And on the slave market, they were sold over to Mr. Sin, who controlled their life. But now, because of the new covenant, the sin power has no power. Because apart from law, sin is dead. Romans 7, verse 18 informs us that apart from law, there is no power of the sin to spring to life and manifest in our experience. But in the Spirit, Lord God, there is righteousness, peace, and joy. In the love of the Spirit, Lord, there's the fulfillment of the aspects of the law that would teach us not a, a to reveal yourself to us so that we would be able to have the intimate knowledge of fellowship with you abiding in the true vine. And then your spiritual life in and through us would manifest the fruit on our branch that is your love and your joy and your peace and your patience and your kindness and your goodness and your faith and your gentleness and your control. Thank you, Father God, for the good news, the unconditional good news. In Jesus' name we give thanks. Amen. Just a couple of comments on Acts 13, 44. <laughs> I'm laughing because I keep falling backwards here. Okay. <laughs> Acts 13, 44. Just, just a, a quick comment. The previous week, we had spoken about verses in Acts 13 going all the way back to Acts 13.23. And we had looked at Acts 13.23 
and we had gone all the way through verse 44. So we start out tonight just reviewing the last verse from last week, which is Acts 13, 44. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city of Antioch and Pisidia gathered at the synagogue to hear the word of the Lord. And who were the guest speakers in the synagogue that next Sabbath day? Paul and Barnabas. Okay, so then the next thing that we encounter is that is that the Jewish leadership of the synagogue, they, they, they see all these people coming to hear Paul and Barnabas speak. I mean, the synagogue is just, is just so filled with people, it's like almost everybody in the city showed up for the service. And, and when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. Because people were listening more to Paul and Barnabas than they were to them. And they, they, they felt like, Paul, you know, you can't be teaching the correct thing. And they began to contradict what Paul was saying, and they heaped abuse on him. But, but I just find it very interesting in the next verse, Acts 13, 46, the response that Paul and Barnabas are giving to these people that were so jealous of them it says in Acts 13, 46, that Paul and Barnabas answered these Jewish leaders boldly. We had to speak the word of God to you first. Now we remember Paul writing in Romans 1, 16, that the good news is first for the Jew and also for the Greek. So they knew a sense of obligation. I mean, Paul and Barnabas did. Paul in Romans 1, 14 felt like he was under obligation, you know, a debtor, you know, like he had a debt to pay, like he was under obligation to preach first to the Jews and also, you know, to the Greeks and and to the wise and to the foolish, you know, I mean, like talking to everybody, right? He felt like, you know, I got to preach the good news to everybody. Well, this is reflected in, in Acts 13, 46. So Paul and Barnabas they said boldly to these people that were jealous of them, we had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you reject the word of God and, and you don't consider yourselves worthy of eternal life on earth, we now turn to the non-Israeli nations as being the audience that they want to focus on, not the, the people that are the religious Jews, but focus on the non-Jewish people. Because even people came to the synagogue that were from a non-Jewish background because they were seeking the God of the Jews, even though they weren't born Jewish. They were honoring God and worshiping God and attending synagogue. Okay, but I just need to say a quick thing, even though that's not going to happen. Okay. There is a background scripture that is very important for understanding Acts 13, 46. Remember that part of the verse, you know, since you reject the word of God and don't consider yourselves worthy of eternal life on earth, then we now turn to the non-Israeli nations. There's a background scripture that's really important. And quite honestly, this is such a big subject talk about the background scripture that it could be a message in and of itself. It's that big in terms of importance. But I'd like to at least say something about it tonight. See, there's a background verse in, in the book of Daniel. Okay? And, and, and when the book of Daniel in the 12th chapter in verse 2, Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, when this statement in the Hebrew Bible was translated into the Greek language. The phrase from the Greek Bible that is used in Daniel 12 2, the phrase is zoe ionios. Now, now that's Greek. Zoe is speaking of life and Ionios is 
describing an age on the earth when God makes himself real so that his reality is an uncontested truth among all the people of the world. I mean, this is when God shows up on earth and reveals himself. This is the age when he does this. Okay? It's, it's the age of God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. It, it is a singular age in the Greek, but the word is an adjective. So it's describing a quality of life that you find in a particular age, which we could honestly call the New Covenant Age. And, and so what happens is, as background to Acts 13.46, I'm saying to understand the implications of this verse in Acts 13.46, you know, you don't consider yourselves worthy of eternal life on earth, zoe ionios, right? We've got to understand something about this Daniel 12 too, right? Because the people that Paul and Barnabas are speaking to have a certain perspective in their own mind about the meaning of Daniel 12 too. Why do I say that? Because the Judaism of the first century was according to one 21st century rabbi a brand of Judaism that in 333 BC became a new brand of Judaism that no longer had the biblical roots when Jesus says in Matthew 5, 17, I didn't come to abolish the Jewish law and the prophets in the sense of the Jewish Bible. I didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. Well, this brand of Judaism that this one modern rabbi talks about beginning in 333 B.C. is a brand of Judaism that takes Daniel 12, 2, right? Takes Daniel 12, 2 as the main verse of this new brand of Judaism, takes Daniel 12, 2, and essentially takes it as a foundational verse upon which to build a whole system of interpreting the scripture through the lens of that Daniel 12, 2. In other words, to try to make that the foundation of your understanding of God and his relationship to you and to everyone else and try to build a theology, if you will, of how to interpret the Bible in light of Daniel 12, too. Now, now here's what's happening. Daniel 12, too, is making a statement and saying that, let's see if we can at minimum paraphrase what Daniel 12, too, is saying. It's saying that some people who have died, because it's talking about, you know, people that have physically died. I mean, that's the context of what Daniel 12 2 is talking about. You know, it's talking about people sleeping in the dust of the earth. You know, people that have died, their bodies have disintegrated into the ground, basically. Okay, so Daniel 12 2. Some people who are sleeping in the dust of the ground. They will awake, picturing their bodily death like they were going to sleep, only to later awaken or rise from the dead and have their humanity be recreated by God so that they would be alive on the earth, right? Again. But the Greek Bible says that when they wake up and then they're alive on the earth again it is with a quality of life that is called in the Greek Bible zoe ionios it is a life that is pertaining to an age that is complete knowledge of God no confusion total clarity you you, you have in Psalm 36 9 the fountain of life because everything is enlightened. Everything is in the light of God's truth being so plainly revealed that in Psalm 36 9, you know, God's the fountain of life and in his light then we see light. We see in Ephesians 5 9, the fruit of the light as being all goodness and all righteousness and 
all truthfulness. Well, that's the age of God's revealing Himself in what is called the Messianic age or the New Covenant age or the Kingdom of God age or when God is known to everybody on the planet. Well, that quality of life that is in the Greek Bible, zoe ionios, is what it's saying in Daniel 12, 2, that some people are going to experience on the side of a bodily resurrection in the future. Some will experience this, right? And then it says in Daniel 12, 2, that others will get a bodily resurrection and they'll wake up from sleeping in the dust of the ground. And, and yet it says about them that, that, that they'll be alive again on the earth, but their condition, according to Daniel 12, 2, is that they will feel disgrace and they will feel shame and they will, in my opinion, feel like Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3, that after eating fruit, that God said, that's not my will for you to eat that fruit. Instantly they felt shame, they felt disgrace, they felt embarrassed to be in the presence of God. He comes looking for Adam and he's hiding behind the tree and he says, I feel naked, I don't, I don't want you to see me in this condition. You know, that type of thing in, in Daniel 12 too. You know, some awake to this, this shame and, and disgrace. Well, what has happened there in Daniel 12 too? And, and, and remember now, the people that Paul and Barnabas are talking to in Acts 13, 46, the one verse we're discussing with its background verse that's so important to understand Daniel 12 too, that without understanding Daniel 12 too, its background, since it was the foundational verse for a new brand of Judaism, you know, that, that, that had been severed from the law and the prophets as far as their root system of biblical understanding of God's character and his purpose and will. Okay, Daniel 12 too, is the only verse in the Hebrew Bible that looks at the bodily resurrection as potentially a negative experience for somebody. Not at all like Isaiah 26, 19, you know, you know, like in Isaiah 26, Isaiah 26, 19, your dead people will in the future live together with my dead body will they arise. You know, people will wake up and they'll shout for joy. You know, that's, that's not distinguishing between this one dead person over here that gets blessed and then another dead person gets cursed by coming back to life, being a good thing for somebody and bad experience for somebody else. I mean, that type of, you know, distinguishing, you know, between, let's say, Malachi 3.18 which says, I'll make a distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between what's common and what's, you know, ceremonially unclean. That type of distinction, you know, that's made in Malachi 3.18, you know, I'm, I want you to know that there's a different difference between, you know, the righteous and, and the unrighteous, those who serve God, those who don't serve God, you know, ceremonially clean versus ceremonially unclean type distinction. Well, in the rest of the Hebrew Bible, which is Jesus' Bible, all of that distinction between this one group of people and the other group of people pertained to the present age, pertained to the life that we're living now. In no other verse in Jesus' Bible do you see a future experience of a bodily resurrection from the dead and it be, for some people, a good thing, and for other people, a negative thing. So you need to be saved from a bodily resurrection, if you're some people. We don't see that anywhere else in the Hebrew Bible, with that distinction between the righteous and the wicked, as carried over into the coming age, or the bodily resurrection, bringing life back on earth for everyone, I mean, that would like be, be so much the example of why the modern rabbi said that in 333 BC, 
there was a new brand of Judaism that, that was severed from the biblical root system of biblical theology because Daniel 12.2 is the only verse in the entire Hebrew Bible that brings this distinction between one group of people against another group of people as being different in their experiences in the context of after they have died because the rest of the Law and the Prophets says that when you die, then that is the end of the shame and the disgrace like Genesis chapter 3. Remember when the shame and the disgrace was introduced for the first time in the Bible. Remember the statement was made to Adam in Genesis 3, 19 and following. Adam, you're going you're gonna to have a miserable life. You know, you're going to work hard. You're going to have sweat drip from your eyebrow. And then you will experience this suffering until the day you die. Until the body disintegrates into the ground. Meaning that it's kind of like a mercy killing in Genesis 3. That when you die, it will be the end of your suffering in that sense. Then the shame and the disgrace will be over. But in Daniel 12, 2, the only verse in the Hebrew Bible that does this, it resurrects the shame and the disgrace. It resurrects the negative experience. As if God's destiny for you was really a miserable existence. So that not even death would be able to save you from your sin. But like you'd be resurrected in your sin. Like, like the opposite of a Daniel 9.24. You know, that, that the Messiah would finish the transgression. Which Jesus says the words from the cross in John 19.30. It's finished. Which is alluding to the prophecy of Daniel in 9.24. The Messiah would finish the transgression. Put an end to sin. Accomplish atonement and reconciliation. And all of the things. And then, and then the apostles preaching everywhere that they went. You know, the uh, first importance that the anointed high priest Jesus, he died on behalf of everybody's sin. And because he died on everybody's behalf, then it means that because he's alive, then that proves that he's the only one that's righteous. That everybody else was unrighteous. Everybody else was unclean. Acts 64, 6. All our righteous acts are, are like a garment of, of menstrual time. In other words, like there's nobody righteous. Like, like Romans 3, 9. You know, what's the conclusion then? The Jews and non-Jews alike are all under the power of sin because it is written that there's no one righteous, not even one, no one that does good, no one understands, no one seeks God, etc. In other words, I understand that there's a distinction in the Hebrew Bible between those that are blessed and those that are cursed in this present life. But Daniel 12, 2 is the only verse that takes that distinction between one group and the next and brings it into the coming age in the messianic age on the earth. You have this, this glorious kingdom on earth as it is in heaven and then you have people walking around like they're in the Garden of Eden hiding from God in shame and disgrace again. I mean, in other words, oh, but, but wait a minute now. Didn't it say in Deuteronomy 19.15 that you at least need to have two witnesses to establish something as a fact? Well, I mean, this is the only verse like it in the entire Hebrew Bible. But the new Judaism of Paul and Barnabas' day, starting in 333 B.C., says one modern rabbi, unbiblical in its orientation, taking Daniel 12.2, as a verse that they pull out of the Hebrew Bible and then build a whole doctrinal interpretation of the character of God and everything else about his relationship with us, all based upon the goal in the first century. The goal in the first century is how are we going to get a good resurrection? How are we going to avoid a negative resurrection? How are we going to be favored by God when the dead are raised versus who's going to be cursed by God? What do we have to do to get our righteousness? The rich young ruler. What do I have to do to inherit this Zoe Ionios? What do I have to do? In other words, if I may say real quick, I said that a long time ago and I didn't follow through with that. But in, in Daniel 12, 2, what they did in the New Judaism is that they took that verse 
about some will awake to this good quality of life and some will awake to this negative quality of life. What they did in the New Judaism, they tied that verse together with the last verse of the entire book of Daniel, found in Daniel chapter 12, verse 13. When Daniel was told, in Daniel 12, 13, Daniel was told, as for you, Daniel, an angel was speaking to Daniel, as for you, Daniel, go your way and rest until the end of the days. You know, like the idea of resting or sleeping in death until the end of the days. And in the NIV it says, you're waiting until you will rise, as in rise from the dead people. Okay, Daniel, you're waiting to rise. And in the NIV says this, rise for what purpose? Rise to receive your allotted inheritance in of the inheritance is that God made a covenant with Abraham and remember when it comes to the covenant promise God can't lie that's the Hebrews 618 we mentioned earlier two unchangeable things in which it's impossible for God to lie the promise and the confirming oath well God made a covenant promise to Abraham that he Abraham is the father of the many nations and there's a promise that you're going to get the inheritance. Why? Because of the fact that it was the purpose of God for all of humanity, even from the first chapter of the Bible, Genesis 1, for all humanity to live on the earth and to rule the earth and to project the image of the Creator all over the earth and that the earth would be the inheritance that is given to the family of Adam that is considered the same as the family of God. And that's another subject, my writing a paper on that subject as we speak about the human family of Adam is synonymous with the human family that is God's family, like God considers all of us as his children. But what happened is in the New Judaism of the first century, that the people in Paul and Barnabas's audience, those Jewish leaders, they were into this mindset. They were into this mindset of taking the last verse of the book of Daniel, chapter 12, verse 13, of you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance and tie that together with Daniel 12, 2. In other words, trying to draw a link between the last verse of Daniel, chapter 12, verse 13, rising to receive your lion inheritance, and linking that with the earlier verse in the same chapter 12 of Daniel, linking it with verse 2, that some will get the zoe ionios and some will not get it. So the inheritance is thought of in the New Judaism to be you will inherit zoe ionios. That, that, that in the family of God you'll experience blessing and you'll get a quality of life in the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven if you're among the fortunate ones to be favored by God as opposed to the unfortunate ones that are cursed by God. To have just, you know, a continuation of their crummy life. Like, like death did not save you from the thing that would be your shame and disgrace. Because in Genesis 3, 19 and following, you know, God tells Adam, you know, you're only going to suffer this miserable disgrace until you die. Until you lose your, your body, that's when the, the suffering will be over. But Daniel 12, 2, the only verse in the Hebrew Bible to resurrect that body and have it be a condition of wretched man that I am, you know, well, Daniel 12, 2 wouldn't rescue you from the body of death if you were among the people that were not favored by God. Then, then it would be on and on and on. You'd be saying wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from the body of death? Well, no one! Because God's final conclusion to my existence is that, is, that, is that Jesus the Messiah died, but that's not that's not helping me. Because Daniel 12, 2 says that death is finalizing nothing. It's putting no end to sin. It's, it's not crucifying any old sinful identity. That death is accomplishing nothing. It's like the modern Hinduism. That, that says it's reincarnation and it's all about the people that that had a good 
quality of behavior are going to get a good reincarnated state of being in the future. And it's all performance based. Well, that's what's going on in Daniel 12 too, by making a distinction between this group and the next group, which in the rest of the Hebrew Bible is only a distinction in this life, not after you die. I mean, that's against the law and the prophet. Well, the whole issue in the first century Judaism is that they were trying to say our faith, our religion, and everything about what motivates us to serve God is that we're trying to gain our own personal status of being righteous and having a non sinner status in the eyes of God. So what do we have to do to get our righteousness? Because we have to get our righteousness to be favored in Daniel 12 too with a positive resurrection in the body as opposed to those that don't have the righteous status. They get a negative resurrection in the body. So we have to be, in the first century Judaism, we have to be saved from a negative resurrection. We, we, but in the rest of the Hebrew Bible, being saved is like 2 Timothy 3.15, which you're being saved from everything that was brought in in Genesis 3. You know, saved from temptation, saved from sin, saved from death in the present life. But the rest of, you know, the Hebrew Bible is like, is like, like the professor of the NIV translation that I had in college that said that the NIV translators decided to translate the Hebrew word for salvation in such ways as victory and prosperity and safety and welfare. Well, those ways are all about our present life. They're not about after we die. Okay? So, I'm just saying Daniel 12, 2 is the only verse that takes this issue of the shame and the disgrace of Genesis 3 and, and throws out the end of it meaning when you die, and then resurrects the death to resurrect the shame and the disgrace, meaning that the whole thing of the character of God being good towards everyone that he's made, like the Psalm 145 in the early versions of the NIV, like the 1978 version of the NIV in Psalm 145, 13b, you know, it says, the Lord is good to all and faithful to all his promises and, and good to everyone. You know, like like Psalm 145 is filled with verses, you know, that, that are saying, you know, the Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. And, and he's faithful to all his promises. You know, um, all of these types of things about the character of God are, are, are in that Hebrew Bible. But those are the Verses and those are the emphasis of the Hebrew Bible that the New Judaism of Paul's day completely ignored, and they completely just 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 thought that God had changed in His character, like like the the thing in Malachi three six that says, "I the Lord do not change." That's why you descendants of Jacob are not destroyed. Well, they thought that God had changed. Why? Because they were these Jewish teachers, 333 BC, this modern rabbi that said that's when the new brand of Judaism started. Well, he says, this rabbi says, that these, these Greek philosophers were so appealing as teachers to Jewish rabbis that they would literally go to Greece and sit at the feet of Greek philosophers. And they would gather in all these ideas from Greek philosophy, come back to Israel, and then reinterpret their Hebrew Bible in the light of that Greek philosophy, totally corrupting the distinctive Hebrew Bible that one modern scholar says is unlike any other literature on the planet because of these distinctive truths that God gave to the Jewish people, these truths that are contained in the Hebrew Bible about the character of God, like Psalm 136 with 26 verses in a row, you know, saying that God's faithful love endures forever based upon his unchanging character. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that is in, in Daniel 12, 2, the people that Paul and Barnabas are speaking to in the synagogue, they are people that are 
thinking that I'm serving God because I'm trying to earn a reward and on the day of the bodily resurrection, I'm, I'm not sure that I'll be good enough for God, but I'm sure trying all I can to be good enough for God, right? Well, in Acts 13, 46, think of these words again. When Paul and Barnabas answer these Jewish leaders that are into this brand of Judaism, playing it off of Daniel 12, 2 as their key verse, linking it to the last verse of the book of Daniel, well, when you rise to receive your inheritance, then in their minds, it's going to be you're going to get your inheritance as being your reward called zoe ionios, the quality of life, that it's not a family of God thing. You get the inheritance because God made a covenant with Abraham and, and you're a child of God just because he created you to be his child and to receive the inheritance and you have that birthright by being born into the world as a child of God. No, no, no. This new Judaism said no. The bodily resurrection is get the inheritance because it's linked with Daniel 12 too, performance based. That, you know, the, the rich young ruler, what must I do to inherit? Zoe Ionios. You see how the rich young ruler is trying to tie Daniel 12 2 together with the last verse of the book, verse 13? You know, the inheritance and the, the Zoe Ionios, the quality of life, and trying to make it out to be you know, like not an inheritance as a family issue, but an inheritance as a reward because I was a better performer than my neighbor that unfortunately wasn't favored by God. Well, I mean, nobody had any assurance in the first century. I mean, nobody had any assurance, right? Because everybody was just hoping that God as a judge was going to accept them and, and you know, that type of thing. Well, the people that Paul and Barnabas are talking to, they have this mindset of Daniel, you know, um, 12 to. So think of these words as Paul and Barnabas speak them to the Jewish leaders. Think of these words spoken by Paul and Barnabas to the Jewish leaders in Acts 13, 46. Then Paul and Barnabas answered the Jewish leaders boldly. We had to speak the word of God to you first, but since you reject the word of God and don't consider yourselves worthy of Zoe Ionios, these people listening to Paul and Barnabas are hearing this like we don't consider ourselves worthy of, of getting the reward of Zoe Ionios when all of our Judaism is about that one thing and yet you're telling us that we don't consider ourselves worthy of getting that Zoe Ionios that we're willing to settle for shame and disgrace because we don't see ourselves worthy of this Zoe Ionios? <coughs> you see, the way that Paul and, and Barnabas are talking to these Jewish leaders is sounding to them, in my opinion, like they're saying your rejection of the Word of God is going to earn you guys a negative resurrection. Like, like, like you had your chance. You, 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 you had your chance for a good resurrection in Daniel 12 too. So see you later. We're going to the other nations because God has commanded us, Paul and Barnabas, God's commanded us in Acts 13, 47, the next verse, He's commanded us to go to the nations to, to, to get the salvation you know, to the ends of the earth. Well, this salvation in the context of this synagogue in the first century Judaism, salvation would be salvation from a negative resurrection. You know? And, and, uh, and, and, then, and then you get, you know, Acts 13, 48, mm -hmm. the non-Jews, they're hearing this message, and they're glad. And they honor the word of the Lord. And all, this is the end of verse 48, Acts 13, the end of verse 48, and all who were appointed, and all who were appointed for Zoe Ionios believed. Well, what is that sounding like in the ears of these Jewish leaders? You mean, you mean, if I believe at a moment of time, because the Greek, it's an aorist tense, meaning believe is completed action of the verb, not an ongoing process of believing, which is a lifestyle of believing that's all through the Gospel of John, where it's not an aorist, it's not a completed action of the verb. It's a present tense in Greek, which is the action is incomplete. We keep believing, we keep believing it's a way of life that's common in the Gospel of John. But this is different in Acts 13, 48. This is, and all that were appointed for this Zoe Ionios believed like, like a, a one-time event. They just believed. Kind of like saying the sinner's prayer kind of a thing. Okay? So, you, do you see that, that the people 
in the, the Jewish leadership that through their ears, considering what they believe in, in the brand of Judaism that they're leaders of of the day, they're not hearing the gospel of Jesus from Paul and Barnabas right now. They're not hearing the gospel of Jesus. They're hearing something that is through their filter. Daniel 12, 2. Well, you're condemning us because we can't believe in Jesus. And now we're going to get condemned for that? We're going to have to get a negative resurrection just because our eyes were blinded? Isaiah 6, he blinded their eyes so that they couldn't see. But all that were appointed to have their eyes open believed. And there's some that are going to get this good news. Some will get a good inheritance, but not others type thing. Do you see that that's not the same message as what we went over last Sunday night, where in the law and the prophets that are being emphasized in the earlier part of Acts 13, where Paul is preaching Acts 13, 23, what does he say? We looked at it last week. From King David's descendants, God has brought to Israel the Savior King, Jesus, as He promised. In other words, Jesus is the Savior from death. For some people to not be saved from death would mean that Jesus wouldn't be their Savior, which is contradicting the fact that God fulfilled His promise by bringing Jesus into this world as the promised Savior King? We looked at it last week in Acts 13, 23 and following. And we also looked at the statement after from King David's descendants, God has brought to Israel the Savior Jesus as He promised. Remember how we looked at this last week? You know, in, in Acts 13, 32, another verse we looked at last week in Acts 13, 32. We tell you the good news. This is in the synagogue. This is the same Jewish leaders are in the audience hearing this, right? The same ones into the New Judaism are hearing this in Acts 13, 32, when Paul is speaking. We tell you the good news. What God has promised our ancestors, He has fulfilled for us, their children, that promise by raising Jesus back to life. In other words, he's talking about the significance of the resurrection of Jesus as being the fulfillment of the promise and the covenant faithfulness of God and Jesus being the Savior. In other words, what I'm trying to say is Daniel 12.2 goes off on a non-biblical track when compared to the rest of what the Bible is saying. Matthew 5.17 I didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets. Meaning... I came to fulfill them. It's like Daniel 12, 2 is not a fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Did Daniel, and so, did and so, Daniel write that? I'm sorry? Did Daniel write that? Yes. Yes. Yes, he did. He did. He did. You did. You will let us ask a question later, right? Because I have a lot of questions. Okay. Okay. So, so what, so what I just want to do, just from, from the standpoint of of, of saying what's, what's, what's happening is you see why to understand what was in the mind of the Jewish leaders in that synagogue, their foundational verse of their brand of Judaism is Daniel 12, 2, linked with the last verse of the book of Daniel. And that, that, that if we don't understand that, then we're not going to understand the implications of what they're hearing when they hear Paul and Barnabas boldly saying, since you, you know, reject the word of God and don't consider yourselves worthy of Zoe Ionios, we now turn to the nations, for the Lord has commanded us to be a light to the nations that, that, that the other nations may get the salvation, as if to say not you, but the other nations will get the salvation. And then, and then in the next thing, uh, Acts 13, 48. When the other people of the other nations in the synagogue heard this message about the nations being included, they were glad and they honored the word of the Lord. And all that were appointed for this Zoe Ionios 
believed. And then in verse 49, then the word of the Lord spread through the whole region, but, but the Jewish leaders, they stirred up this persecution against Paul and Barnabas. How does it read in verse 50, Kyle? Ooh. Did this Acts 13, 50? Um, but the Jews incited the prominent... Incited. Okay, thank you. I just need the reminder. Look, Acts 13, 30. But the Jews incited or negatively motivated the women of high social standing and the leading men of the city of Antioch and Pisidia and stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. So what does Paul and Barnabas do in reaction of getting expelled from their region? Well, doggone it, we wanted to leave you anyway. We're shaking the dust off of our sandals as a warning to you. What kind of warning to you? Negative resurrection, Daniel 12, 2 type thing? At least that's what they're hearing. You know, they're shaking the dust off their sandals as a warning to them. And they go on to Iconium, but in Acts 13, 52, the last verse of the chapter, which is Acts 13, the last verse, Acts 13, 52, but the disciples back in Antioch in Pisidia, where Paul gave the synagogue speech that we took many Sundays on, Acts 13, 52, but the disciples in Antioch in Pisidia, they were filled with joy and filled with the Holy Spirit. And then we had... Good to see you, man. Good to see you, man. Good to see you. Love you, man. Love you. Bye, George. Okay. And then and then Acts... Okay, so, so did, you, did you see that? Acts 13, 52. And, and the disciples, you know, in Antioch and Pisidia, they were filled with joy and filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay. Well, I think what I might do is just say, well, yeah, I wanted to do uh, the first uh, seven verses of chapter 14. I mean, I, I wanted to, and we surveyed it at the beginning of the evening. We, we went through those verses. But as far as the comments on the Acts 14, 1 to 7, I feel like I should save them for next week. Yeah, I think I should save them for next week. Because that Daniel 12, 2 thing that I felt needed to be understood as background scripture to really understand the dynamics of what's going on with the reaction of the Jewish leaders to Paul and Barnabas speaking to them is something that that I just had to throw out there because it's so important, not only for understanding Acts 13, but for understanding the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, John, Luke, and all of the, 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 the New Testament. I mean, the New Judaism is all over the New Testament, and you have to discern... Is it consistent with the Law and the Prophets, or is it not consistent with the Law and the Prophets? Is Jesus coming to fulfill that, or is that unfulfilled prophecy, which God intends to be unfulfilled in the case of Daniel 12.2? Daniel 12.2, God intended Daniel 12.2 to be an unfulfilled prophecy with regard to that part of the prophecy that goes away from everything that the Jewish scriptures stand for in terms of all of revelation about God, his character, his promise, his covenant, his, all of his covenant faithfulness is at issue here. So there's more to be said even about that subject, not to mention more to be said about Acts 14, 1 to 7 next week. But I just want to pray real quick, Jesus. We desire to understand this document that we call the literature of the New Testament. And in order to understand this document called the literature of the New Testament, we need to understand what was going on in the first century regarding a brand of Judaism that was existing when Jesus was born among the people of Israel 2,000 years ago. We have not exhausted this subject this evening and talking about the necessity of understanding the background of Daniel 12 2 tied to verse 13 in the same chapter but we just need to throw it out that there is truth of what was going on in the day that the apostles ministered 
that is necessary for us to understand this deliberate contrast that appears in Scripture on some occasions. But this is a major deliberate contrast by putting Daniel 12, 2 in there because that contradicts the entire chapter 9 of the book of Daniel. Daniel 12, 2 contradicts the entire chapter 9 of the book of Daniel that says we're all sinners. And Daniel says, you know, God, we as a nation, we're all sinners. We screwed up. We rebelled. There's no distinction between me and my neighbor when it comes to final analysis of when we all die under the law's penalty, then we were all sinners. But Daniel 12, 2 says, no. There's a modern rabbinic doctrine of the perfectly righteous. And they're getting it from Daniel 12, 2. Assuming that the people that got the eternal life on earth as a quality of life on the side of bodily resurrection got there because they were the perfectly righteous people, etc. There's all these things that we need to understand. There's all these things that we need to unpack. And it's going to take more time to do it than I can put into one evening on a Sunday night. But Jesus, I pray that you will work through us in our study of the scripture so that we will be able to unpack all of this and receive, Father God, what you want us to receive. Yes, the very quality of Zoe Ionios for today. In Jesus' name, amen.